there too. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, and welcome to our Harbor Wild Watch presentation, Sex in the Salish Sea. We have myself, Stina Troyer, and Rachel Easton with you tonight to talk all things racy, romantic, and ridiculous about the ways of reproduction here in the Salish Sea. So I'm Stina and I'm your science specialist. I'm a Libra who likes long walks on the beach. And I think the most romantic sea animal in the Salish Sea is the sea otter because they hold hands and they're so cute and cuddly and adorable. Um, and of course, then there's Rachel Easton. I am the education director for Harbor Wild Watch. I'm also a Libra who shares the same birthday as Stina. That's a fun fact that you didn't know about us. Uh, I definitely love long walks on the beach. I've been married 14 years. It'll be 15 in August. And I think the most romantic animal is the heart cockle, which makes just the perfect heart shape with its silhouette. And we're gonna bring you some of the most wild and crazy uh, reproductive stories, starting things off with the romantic. And I would like to kick this off with just saying how inspiring the ocean is when it comes to romance, right? I might write a Valentine's card that expresses my love and how deep, uh, my love is as deep as the Marianas Trench, which is seven miles, friends, um, right? And so with that, yes, Rachel is going to talk um, initially about one of the most romantic sea creatures you might find while scuba diving in our waters. Now, a lot of people are gonna tell you that the wolf eel is ugly. And I just don't think that's true. These are some of the most adorable fish. They have quite the romantic relationship beginning when they're about four years old. So the um, four-year-old wolf eels, they find a burrow. Um, and when they find another wolf eel, they will invite them into their burrow. And their courtship lasts quite a long time because these animals are not sexually mature until they're seven years old. So they have three years of living together and getting to know one another and snuggling together in their burrow. Then they will mate um, and the female will have about 10,000 eggs in a big egg mass about the size of a volleyball. And both the male and the female will squeeze those eggs into a nice compact ball. Um, they'll be fertilized and then they kind of aerate them and keep them safe um, for about 16 weeks before they hatch. Now the larvae are pelagic. They float away as little swimming fish um, and then eventually will settle in a couple of years to be little small, um, actually orange little uh, eels. Um, but wolf eel is actually kind of a wrong name for this creature because they're not wolves and they're not eels at all. You can see they have these really huge pectoral fins on the side of their body and they also have a gill slit instead of um, just a hole like is typical of most eels. But the wolf part I would say is pretty accurate. They have huge teeth because this is an animal that can eat urchins, big spiny urchins, and they just chomp them down with no issue. Um, but they are monogamous. So once they snuggle into a burrow with another wolf eel, they will stay together their duration of their lives and they can live 25 years or more. So they have a nice long relationship ahead of them. Now, when it comes to crabs, you might initially associate these creatures and romance in one of two ways. There could be the romantic dinner date with candlelight and melty butter, or perhaps a sexually transmitted infection. Now, I will not be talking about either of those when it comes to crab, because crab romance on its own is just a delight. You see in this picture, we have the classic crab hug, um, where a male crab holds on to a female. Now, for all crabs, in order to get larger, they have to molt. So essentially they're unzipping their shell, they're taking out their pinchers, they're taking out their legs, they're taking out their eyeballs, mouth parts, everything comes. It's like you're pulling your hand out of a glove. And when this molting occurs, that's when our females' oviducts are open and available for fertilization. So this crab here is kind of hedging his bets in sensing that, okay, this little lady is about to molt. So I'm gonna hang on to her because I do not want to miss this once in a molting opportunity. Um, and so he'll hold her until she removes that hard shell and he's able to pass on his genes. Now, here's where things get a little bit spicy. If he finds a bigger female, 
he's gonna ditch the little lady because a bigger female means more eggs and more potential for passing on those genes. So uh, the crab hug <laughs> is another romantic, maybe questionably <laughs> romantic category um, of creatures for us this evening. I love it. It's always funny when you find one of those males that's carrying a female that's larger than he is. And she just lets it happen. She's like, yeah, carry me everywhere. And he's like, whoa, holding this big female. So great. I, I do like to think that, you know, once she um, has molted and they've done the gene passing things, um, sometimes he will hold on to her a little extra to like protect her as um, her claws and things harden. So that's as he should. <laughs> All right, next up in the romantic category is the fish that dies for love, the salmon. Um, and we have a variety of species that are found here in our Pacific waters. We have more salmon species than any other place on earth because our habitat is just so productive here. Um, but what I wanna talk about is the fact that salmon go through an incredible change in order to uh, carry out the last step of their life cycle. So these are fish that are hatched in freshwater. They migrate down into the estuaries. They go all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. They eat lots of food. They get nice and big and fat and very fit and healthy. And then they come back. And before they really come all the way back into the freshwater, they undergo this huge change. Their, um, their coloration is going to change. And that's probably the most notable thing that happens. Um, we see bright silvery fish turning red and green and purple and splotchy and striped. Um, they grow a hump on their back. So underneath that first dorsal fin, they get this large muscular hump. Um, and the, the pink salmon have the nickname of being the humpy salmon because the, it's very exaggerated in the males. They form a kipe and their mouth can no longer close. And the kipe is that hooked nose, which gives the genus its name, the Oncorhynchus, that means the big hook nose. Um, so they, they form a big kipe. Their jaws are kind of gaping open. They can't close them fully. Uh, most of their internal organs actually atrophy to make room for eggs and sperm that they're gonna be um, needing as they move upstream. Uh, they just start to kind of melt uh, apart. They lose a lot of the scales, the protective ocean going scales on the outside of their skin come off um, as they migrate up into fresh water. And so quite often we see these fish and they're looking rough in the fresh water system. Um, there's a, a bunch of locations locally where you can um, visit and watch chum salmon spawning is probably the easiest species to see. Um, but all of this is because the female salmon are choosy. They wanna pick the males that have the best genes to pass on to her offspring. So she's looking for big hooked kipe. She's looking for big, serious, huge teeth that form in the jaw. She's looking for bright, bright colors, big, powerful hump um, and strong musculature um, to be able to propel those animals upstream to the spawning ground. So she's choosy um, and she has to attract the right male as well. So both males and females undergo this transformation. And it's really remarkable. It's, it's just wild. Um, but once the animals have spawned, they do die, um, which is quite unfortunate. They don't ever get to see their young. They don't take care of them in any way, but they do enrich the environment around them. So those carcasses that are left behind by the dead parents enrich the soils, enrich the plants, which shade the creek and protect it. Um, and it's quite the circle of life. All right, Sina, tell us about well, it. Yes, for our world's largest octopus, the giant Pacific octopus, um, this is an animal that's well armed for love. So it just is a perfect addition to this category. But I have to say there's um, little room for fidelity when it comes to the short life of this octopus here. Um, cephalopods in general are a rather promiscuous bunch. Um, and for the lady octopus, um, she's looking around for that passionate embrace of, of a male. And when she finds um, the, right, the right gentleman octopus out there, um, he hands off his special baby making arm. Um, so be careful next time you're shaking hands with an octopus because you don't want to end up with the hectocotylus. Um, and the female octopus, she's going to hold on to that special um, packet of sperm until she's ready uh, to release her eggs. And on average, the giant Pacific octopus 
releases about 20,000 to 100,000 eggs. And those are gonna pass through that special <laughs> packet um, and become fertilized as uh, the female carefully lays each one of those eggs in her den. Um, and they're about the size of a grain of rice. And this is where like, um, not only romantic, but like if you wanna write a great Mother's Day card, theme it after the giant Pacific octopus, because these mothers, they spend their last dying moments caring for these little eggs as they circulate water, uh, making sure they're oxygenated and safe from hungry predators um, until those babies hatch out into the, to the pelagic seas. And so um, it is, it's truly a tragic thing that as soon as, you know, after the reproducing is done, um, these are an animal that will pass away. So uh, it definitely makes me think of, you know, their three hearts skipping a beat for each other as they're out there finding love in the sea. So um, with that, I mean, it definitely is a nice segue into the racy category here tonight because Rachel has some more cephalopods, cephalopods to, <laughs> to speak to and they're, uh, and they're promiscuous love life. So I think you really could classify any of these animals into that racy category because we are talking reproduction, but some are racier than others. And these cephalopods, the squid and cuttlefish, definitely have layers to their reproduction. They're short-lived, most of them living less than a year, which means they need to grow, feed, and pass on their genes before they pass. So um, when we're talking about cuttlefish, they have this remarkable ability to change the color of their skin. They have chromatophores, which are little tiny um, cells that are either open like an umbrella and dark, or they're closed up and light, and they can change them instantaneously. So here in the image um, on the screen, you can see this is a cuttlefish that's showing a different image on the left and one on the right. And what they'll do is they will um, advertise like, hey, I'm excited, I'm willing, I'm looking for love with one side. And that's what they the males will flash to the female. The female will flash back like, hey, maybe I'm receptive or maybe don't leave, leave me alone kind of thing, different messages. But to the other males, this male cuttlefish is going to display like a warning, like, this is my territory. This is my cuttlefish girl. Do not interfere. And he's flashing like, aggression aggression on one side and like hey pretty lady on the other side and if that's not enough then there are certain sneaker males of cuttlefish that actually advertise that they're a female and that allows them to get really up close to the other females who are less on guard and then all of a sudden they will just kind of like switch their message and be like oh no just kidding hey don't you think I'm so handsome? And then they'll just sneak in front of all of the other larger aggressive males. Um, they also have a hectocotylus like organ where they'll just kind of pass off a little sperm packet to the females to use um, as she sees fit. They don't have to be used right away. They can be stored for a couple of months, which is kind of wild. Um, so she can be kind of hanging on to um, a nice romantic encounter from her past. Or she can ditch it um, for the next new hot guy who comes along. Uh, which is kind of wild. When it comes to squid, we have um, quite interesting reproduction that happens with the opalescent or market squid that we have here in our waters in the Salish Sea. They also have chromatophores on their body and they um, advertise and communicate with um, each other visually. And that red coloration on the tentacles that you see is an excited kind of flash of color um, for when mating takes place. The females um, are often they're, they're a little bigger than the males and they are outnumbered by the males. And so typically um, it's not uncommon for the females to get kind of ganged up on by all of these males who are chasing her down, trying to win her affection. And sometimes she's had enough. And what the female squid have been noticed doing is they will flash a bright white stripe down their back. And that's thought to show off kind of like the testes on the squid. And it's her saying like, no, dude, I'm just one of the boys. Um, don't mess with me. And the boys back off. They're like, oh, sorry, sorry, sir. Miscommunication. I, I didn't see you there. Um, and, and then she gets to have a break and be more choosy about um, which mate that she does select. 
when it comes to um, commercial harvest of this squid, this is one that's really popular for um, fishermen to go, you go out to a nice lit dock with lights in the water. Um, the squid are attracted, they'll all come out um, thinking it's a full moon and they will mate with your lure, which is shaped like a squid with a big barbed crown at the bottom of it. So the poor squid, they run up, they try to mate um, and they get caught by their genitals, um, which is a little bit just, what a way to go. I'm so sorry for those poor squid. <laughs> but um, what we're also seeing in this image is that the squid lay their eggs in big masses. So each one of these little fingers is laid by one female. Um, there can be hundreds of little eggs inside and they will all hatch at the same time. So all of these squid are going to hatch um, on the same night so that there's a bit of strength in numbers and they can overwhelm the predators and a few will be able to survive to be grown-ups. Um, to carry on the rest of this reproductive cycle. Wild. Yeah. Uh, another interesting mollusk in our racy category is the pteropod, also known as the sea butterfly. And they're, I think, just a beautiful creature that are very active little animals and they spend their life in the water, floating and drifting, swimming, eating, and of course, getting it on. Um, and for this animal, you want to imagine kind of that coiled shell of a snail that you might be familiar with. And then of like thinking about like a moon snail, instead of that huge slimy foot, um, that slimy foot part is modified in a way that they can kind of flutter these transparent wings and swim through the rat through swim through the water, rather than like crawling along the bottom. Um, now, this active lifestyle makes for an interesting sex life because they're out, you know, in the great open ocean looking for love. And when they find each other, it's a moment, right? They have to take advantage of this. And it's, it's quite the, um, the active sex life they have. Um, and what's interesting about it is um, it's also free from gender issues, right? There's uh, the males uh, will actually often find each other. And so uh, the pteropods will mate male to male. And during this mating period, will then turn into females, um, which is a pretty good strategy for uh, sea creatures that are out in the open ocean. Uh, you don't want to have to wait around to, you know, fit the right gametes together when you can just, okay, we'll just switch things up to make it work for us, um, which is pretty fabulous. <laughs> and so uh, it's also <laughs> interesting to know that, you know, they'll hold each other and they'll go at it for hours. Um, and part of that is, you know, you need a little bit of energy to get this action on. And so they'll actually eat um, while they're in the act, um, in this intimate encounter. And so uh, I kind of like to imagine like, you know, like, let's just like, we're not going to pause anything. We're just going to grab a sandwich along the way and uh, keep fueled up for this adventure. So um, it's just a delightful little thing to imagine these snails just uh, going wild at it. And of course, once those eggs are fertilized, um, they'll kind of lay them in these little floating ribbons. Um, well, um, and that's one, one, um, I guess, way. And then others will actually brood their young where they'll hold on to those eggs and release kind of smaller numbers of the more mature offspring. So um, a lot of different species of pteropods uh, kind of have a few different strategies of that. But um, just a, an impressive little uh, love life for this tiny little potato chip of the sea. They're, they're little, right? They are little. And they're also, um, there's a, on the top of the screen, there's kind of the indicator of how climate change impacts these. So they're a great um, climate change indicator. I said that already, but uh, their shells are susceptible to the um, changing pH of our seas. And so with more acidic waters, um, they're not able to develop as easily. And because this is an important species in the food web, um, right, we mentioned they're the potato chip of the sea. Uh, they definitely, if, if they're impacted, that cascades through the rest of the food web. And so um, it's one of these things that scientists are looking at as an indicator of, uh-oh, right, we might be in trouble if um, our actions uh, maintain the same path that they're on. So. For the sake of the pteropod and their exciting sex life, like let's get our act together, humans. <laughs> we love it. All right. Well, um, it's time to talk about the stellar sea lion. 
and their particularly uh, interesting mating habits. Here in the center of the image, you can see the large male. Um, and groups of sea lions have lots of different names. If they're on land, they're called one thing. If they're in the water, they're, they're called another thing. But during their breeding season, they are called, um, there is a harem of sea lions. And what that means is one male will stake his claim on the beach and defend certain territory. And he does his best to show off how huge he is and muscular and just look at that face. I mean, he just looks so handsome, right? So strong, so. Um, but the female sea lions are the ones who truly hold the power. They decide which male is the one that is the best for them. They decide when mating occurs by acting submissive on the beach and they'll kind of roll around and um, be very coy, I guess, about it. And they, um, they maintain these harems uh, up to about 16 females per male. And they will um, mate during a certain time of the year and time their reproduction with um, the development of their babies so that next spring when the babies are born, they're all born at the same time. And that's a little bit of strength in numbers there. And then the females will come into heat very quickly after that. So this big male, um, well, it looks like he would be um, quite aggressive in defending um, his females. He doesn't really care about that so much as he cares about where on the beach he is. Um, the best places on the beach have the biggest males who can defend the best territory and the females will choose kind of who's got the nicest house, who's got the best spot, um, as well as who is the most handsome of the bunch. So uh, kind of interesting. And then because all of the babies share the same father, there is um, some kind of interesting DNA transfers that happen there as well. So um, just, I really, I really, I just love his face. Look at him. He just seems so proud of all his, uh, all his girlfriends here. Um, and they're not monogamous. They'll they'll change things up. Um, the females will decide they might mate with one male and then swim down the beach and mate with another male. Um, and who who really knows whoever is gonna um, fertilize those eggs? All right. And no talk about the reproduction of sea creatures would be complete without talking about barnacles and just how absolutely wild um, and what amazing length they will go to for their reproductive success. So barnacles uh, have quite the package. They have the largest penis relative to body size of any animal, which that in itself is, wow. Like it is eight times the diameter of their body in length. That is wild um, because barnacles are sessile that means they're animals that are stuck in place once they're past their larval form. So they can never move. So if you see a barnacle, it is stuck there. It never gets to travel outside of that. So they've evolved a penis that does the traveling for them. Um, when a barnacle's in the mood, usually when the tide is high, they will extend that organ and go knocking and kind of probing to all their neighboring barnacles. And however many barnacles they can reach is however many will be fertilized, which is kind of wild, right? Um, not only that, they can grow a new penis every year. So about every nine months or so, they shed the old one. Um, they take stock of the ocean conditions around them. And then they grow a new penis to fit. So if they're in calm waters, they'll have a much longer and more slender organ. If they're in more rough seas and the motion of the ocean is a little bit more extreme, they're going to grow a shorter, stouter one that's not going to break off. Um, important. Um, <laughs> but you may be wondering, like, what about the poor barnacles who are left kind of all alone on a rock with no nearest neighbors around them? They're not out of the game yet. They can participate in what's called sperm casting, which is where they will thrust their gametes into the water um, and hope for the best. We kind of call it spraying and praying. Um, and the female barnacles, when they reach out into the water, um, can separate barnacle sperm from the rest of the plankton in the water. Um, and once they have enough, they'll fertilize their eggs. Eggs hatch and are planktonic. Um, and the little larvas drift around for a couple days before they settle out um, in their final location. 
Um, what I find most remarkable about this is not only do they regrow a new organ, not only is it the biggest relative to body size of any animal on the planet, but it, it exhibits a, um, a feature called phenotype, phenotype plasticity, which means they can change their phenotype, how their genes are expressed based on the circumstances that they are in. So that's um, kind of akin to you being able to change the amount of melanin in your skin depending on whether you're going on a tropical vacation or not. How cool would that be? Um, so they assess, they regrow, um, they shed. Oh, and they are hermaphroditic too. So no matter, um, even if a lone barnacle is sitting there, you know, they can cast their gametes. They can also catch gametes um, from the water. They can um, knock on doors of their nearest neighbor and fertilize just about anybody and get fertilized by other neighbors too as well. So barnacles wild this is where we you know really just get to drive home like you're gonna go to the beach and uh, now you know more than we think you want to know but it's also pretty delightful <laughs> uh so yes moving into that ridiculous category as if what we've already covered isn't ridiculous enough uh there's more folks there's more <laughs> and we'll we'll kick it off with the aggregating anemone which is just bizarre as it's own sea creature, right? They have <laughs> algae living under their skin. They have stinging tentacles that they can use to catch their food. But their reproductive strategy is something all on its own, just bizarre, uh, fabulous, ridiculous, wild. Um, what they do is often binary fission, which you can't knock it till you try it. Essentially, <laughs> it's one individual ripping itself into two, which you know, would be kind of nice to do because I could use some more Rachel's like Rachel, could you just rip yourself in half and become two of you and I'll become two of me and we could just right populate a whole little <laughs> for an enemy's case. You could have a, a beach whole, walk whole at walk. every beach at every low yeah. tide. It'd be wonderful. It'd be wild. Maybe it's good we can't do that. Anyway, <laughs> so these little anemones, they will clone themselves. And so one individual becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and it goes on and on and on. But what's interesting is these individual sea anemones, um, while they may have a high number of clones, these clones aren't going to get along very well with the clones of another um, individual anemone. So what's really fun is when we're out on the beach and we see kind of big swaths of these aggregating anemones, is we look closely to see if we can find the no anemone zone. And that's going to be an area kind of <laughs> wiggling between maybe one pocket of an enemy is in another, and they get pretty defensive. They have defensive guts that they digest each other with. Um, and that's kind of a cool space where you'll see things like limpets or barnacles or mussels or other creatures kind of growing in between um, because those separate clones just will not interact together. And so um, and an interesting bit of competition um, paired with that interesting reproductive strategy. And of course, like the barnacle, um, they also are able to do that kind of casting of gametes and hoping that works out too. But uh, binary fission, baby, I'm, it would, I'm into it. It would be great. <laughs> it does look a little painful though, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. All right, and continuing on in that um, kind of spray and pray of the broadcast spawners, here we have a uh, sunflower sea star taking on a quite remarkable pose. Now, they're not doing yoga. Um, this animal is actually getting ready to release gametes into the water. Um, they want to time this with the release of other sea stars. And this is an animal that Though they have lots of eyes, a tiny one at the end of each arm, they're not exactly able to just look out and go, oh, hey, like there's a bunch of sea stars here, let's all spawn. Um, so they'll use a little bit of um, chemical perception to be able to kind of smell when they're in the area of other um, sunflower stars. They'll gather together in big groups, they'll hunch upward like this, and on the high tide, that's um, usually coinciding with the full moon, they will all spawn. And not only are the sunflower stars, but all sea stars um, in our areas will do this, as well as many other animals. 
So most of those animals that are broadcast spawners, they're timing it with the full moon so that they can overwhelm the predators and give their offspring kind of a fighting chance. And so in this case, the males will be releasing sperm, the, the females will be releasing eggs, they'll mingle in the water um, and some will become fertilized and then they will be planktonic for a time. They'll settle out as little teeny tiny baby stars um, and kind of continue on with this life cycle. Um, there is one sea star though, the six rayed star, which is also known as the brooding star, um, which does not do this. The females actually hold on to those little eggs. And once they're fertilized, little teeny tiny baby sea stars sit underneath her and she kind of cocoons and protects them um, until they're big enough to crawl away and kind of continue on with the rest of their life. And they have a much higher success rate than just the broadcast spawners. Um, which is a great reproductive strategy. But of course, there's a cost there because it limits the movement of the six rayed star. It limits how much food they can get. There's always a trade off there. So um, I'm kind of glad I don't have 30,000 children at a time, um, but I'm going to have to take care of mine for decades, right? Um, so there's, there's a cost there um, with the trade off between different reproductive strategies. But uh, I just love the thought of all these stars all on one grand night, like tonight's the night. Okay, guys, here's the moment. Ready? Go. And they all release gametes into the water. Fabulous. That's like verging on romantic, really. It could, it could be, yeah. <laughs> Except for they don't see each other and they don't really know each other's there. <laughs> yeah, which then, of course, uh, the oysters make me think of our 18th century lover, Casanova, which uh, has a little bit of credit to their uh, breakfast of 50 oysters every morning um, mm -hmm. because oysters are indeed an aphrodisiac. Um, there's been some interesting studies that show that oysters have certain amino acids that uh, get you in the mood. And so, uh, <laughs> well, that, I'm not gonna get into that so much. <laughs> Um, we'll focus on the interesting <laughs> uh, sex life of oysters. And we have two species here in the Puget Sound, Salish Sea area. We have the Olympia oyster, which is our native species, and the Pacific oyster or Japanese oyster, which has been around, uh, isn't native to the area, but it's been around long enough that it's somewhat naturalized. Um, but they have somewhat similar, but there's uh, some unique differences between the two. Uh, and so starting kind of with our Olympia oyster, uh, they don't have as many um, offspring as our Pacific oyster, which um, is kind of a challenge when it comes to like their recovery here in the sound because they're uh, not doing so great in our waters, unfortunately. Um, um, and part of that is, well, maybe not part of that. I'm not sure why they're not doing well. well. Well, that's a discussion for another talk. But what's interesting about them is their sequential hermaphroditism. Or hermaph blah, blah, blah. They're sequential hermaphrodites. And that's awesome because they can switch from male to female to male to female. And for our Olympia oysters, they'll often do some of that um, brooding of the young. Um, so they'll hold their eggs and they'll get fertilized and then they'll release um, more developed mature offspring into the water. Um, and that, of course, does kind of lower numbers, but, you know, crossing your fingers or your shells for higher success rates. Whereas the Pacific oysters, um, they're another one that kind of on an annual basis switch from male to female, but they're um, just spawning out. <laughs> and so they release, uh, what is, I have, I don't remember numbers very well, 200 million uh, gametes out into the water. So the 200 million compared to the like 250,000 for the Olympia oysters is a pretty dramatic difference in that uh, number during their reproductive time, um, which is also happens to be the time when folks um, are advised not to eat oysters. And it's not because they're necessarily poisonous during the months um, without ours, right, those summer months, but because their tissues, um, all that energy is kind of devoted to producing gametes um, and so their tissues are more watery and it's just not as tasty. Um, so really uh, the spring is your ideal time to eat oysters, especially if you're going in for that aphrodisiac uh, <laughs> quality there. Um, but yeah, uh, sea star, or not sea stars, oysters, they're bringing it on. We love Maybe the sea stars that eat the oysters are going for that aphrodisiac quality. There you go, oh man. <laughs> 
Could um, be. And then the interesting thing uh, that I almost forgot I wanted to mention with the Pacific oysters is they've been a great species to kind of um, like state parks put them out all the time um, because they grow a lot faster than the Olympia oysters. So they're um, more readily harvestable for whatever <laughs> endeavors you plan to use them for. Um, <laughs> And what's nice is that typically they need warmer water to successfully reproduce. And because the Puget Sound is so cold, um, normally they're not able to successfully pass, pass on those genes and make things happen. But because we've had some recent warm spells and really a whole like marine heat wave, um, these Pacific oysters have been successful at reproducing naturally. Um, rather than relying on humans to seed them out on beaches. And so part of our community science work doing beach monitoring at local sites sees kind of in the warmer on our warmer sites that aren't in the narrows, um, but are rather in like car inlet. Um, there are just oysters all over the beaches that have started kind of um, reproducing on their own, which is an interesting kind of look at, oh, here's some something we've noticed uh, in doing this work. So. Uh, it'll be cool to see how that goes. And we're also doing some projects uh, to restore the native oysters with a bunch of other awesome organizations. And so uh, hopefully uh, that work will give us some good insight on what works for bringing back our native oyster to these waters. I love it. I always get excited when I see uh, an Ollie oyster. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. Oh, look at you. You're here. <laughs> You're doing it. <laughs> but no, what a noise an oyster. What a noise an oyster. A noisy noise, a noise an oyster. <laughs> and with that, let's talk sea slugs. I thought you were gonna say being shellfish. Oh, I could have. <laughs> All right, so uh, last up for our ridiculous category is the nudibranch. Um, and they're not just ridiculous because of this quite flamboyant appearance that they've taken on, their reproductive efforts are a little bit convoluted as well. Um, so this is a slug, it's related to the slugs in your gardens, just a lot prettier. Um, and they live in uh, varied habitats from deep water to the shallows to the intertidal zone. This one happens to be an opalescent nudibranch, but um, their reproduction is the same for just about all of these species. They are hermaphrodites, so each individual possesses both male and female sex organs. And when they happen upon another nudibranch, it's like a handshake. They line up side to side, they exchange their gametes, shake hands for uh, from sometimes it's a couple of minutes to several hours. Um, there's a gamete exchange, both uh, exchange their gametes, and then both get pregnant, are able to lay eggs, and what we see is in these eggs, these beautiful um, kind of gooey clusters, and you can identify the slugs by their eggs. So you can see the eggs here in this image here, the slug is kind of coiled around them. Opalescent nudies eggs kind of resemble the serrata on their back, um, but some of our other slugs like the sea lemons make a, like a little coil of um, goo that looks like cake frosting that's yellow, the same color as they are. Um, barnacle eating nudies do the same thing, but it's a little white coil that blends in with the barnacles really well. Um, the eggs can be really, really gorgeous. And then the little teeny tiny baby slugs are gonna hatch out of those eggs. Um, they have a short lifespan. So their whole goal in life is to eat as much food as possible, to run into as many um, nudibranchs as possible and um, shake as many hands as they possibly can, which is kind of wild. Um, every once in a while, conditions will line up and you'll have multiple individuals all together and they just kind of make this huge conglomeration um, and everybody's just swapping sperm um, with one another. Uh, it can be really kind of wild and cool to see when you happen upon a big cluster of all of these animals. Would you call that a slug orgy, Rachel? I would. I, I yeah. Just yeah. checking. Slug <laughs> like orgy for sure. Um, yeah. It, it, I've I've only seen it a couple times, but it is like amazing how many individuals will gather for those events. Um, all right, so with that, um, just a reminder that Harbor Wild Watch is your local environmental education group. We are um, continuing to do our excellent programming that we're kind of well known for in the community. Um, 
educating and inspiring stewardship for the Salish Sea. Of course, right now we are doing all of our programming digitally, so you can tune in um, through YouTube, Facebook, uh, and TikTok as well. And we are going to continue to do this moving forward and make sure that um, what we create is available to um, as many people as possible. So thank you to everyone who has liked and shared and commented on all of our um, digital efforts that helps to kind of amplify our voice and get it out to more people. We have a couple of upcoming events that I want to highlight. Um, Dina, would you tell us a little bit about Cocktails and Fish Tales that's coming up next week? Absolutely. So um, this is our science social uh, that happens monthly on the third Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And our first event of 2021, we will kick off with Dr. Sarah Gravem. Um, and she was one of the lead authors on the report that listed sunflower stars on the critically endangered list. Um, so sea star wasting um, is another big community science thing that Harbor Wild Watch has participated in, as well as many other groups. And so we'll get to learn how that community science effort um, and all that data helped better understand this really incredible decline in these populations of the world's largest sea star and um, what we might be able to do to help make sure that this iconic Pacific Northwest species comes back. So um, that should be a fascinating talk with her. Um, we can't wait to have her and um, we have a whole lineup of great speakers. So. Stay tuned for those events. You're, the lineup for 2021 is exceptional. I am so excited uh, to be able to hear so many amazing scientists and presenters. So thank you for that. Um, coming up the first Saturday of the month in March is our Peer Into the Night program. We're going to be uh, taking you down below the surface uh, to examine some really cool sea life. Um, through the eyes of our volunteer scuba divers. So we're getting out and exploring a couple new locations to us. So we've been having a great time uh, just editing those and looking through all the footage and seeing um, what amazing creatures call the Salish Sea home. So stay tuned for that. And then um, we are still continuing to offer our in-school our in-school workshops for teachers. So um, Dina and myself have both gotten very comfortable using Zoom and Microsoft Teams and other digital ways to get our, our content in front of the students um, in kind of a little smaller gathering where students can ask questions and raise their hands and we can go um, exploring all these interesting ideas. So if you're interested in that, um, head over to our website, harborwildwatch.org, and you can um, get some more information there. As always, we do have um, some great social media sites that we are um, making content for. Of course, Facebook and Zoom and YouTube, we're trying to get to a thousand subscribers. So if you know someone who is not following our YouTube channel, um, please ask them to subscribe. As soon as we get to a thousand followers, then we're able to take our, um, our live broadcast live on YouTube in the field. So we can go to the beach and we can go to the forest and the wetland and we can um, broadcast to YouTube, which is a much more accessible site for students who might not have social media um, capabilities through their school computers. So um, help us out there. Go tell everyone you know to go subscribe to our page. And then of course we're on TikTok as well. So we're making quick, short, educational and fun videos there as well as doing live broadcasts as well. Uh, Stina also puts together an amazing weekly events email. And if you're not um, subscribed to that, head on over to our website or send her an email and we'll get you signed up. So Absolutely. thank you everybody for tuning in with us tonight um, on this lovely Valentine's Day. We hope that you learned, we hope that you had fun, and we hope that you're inspired to take care of these amazing, incredible animals that call the Salish Sea home. If you like this broadcast and you want to support us and continue, um, to do this fun and engaging uh, environmental education. As always, we appreciate any donation that you could make to our organization. That can be made on our website, harborwildwatch.org. Or if you can't donate financially, we know times are tough for a lot of people. You can always like, share, comment, um, and tell a friend. Those are all free things that you can do that really help um, boost any nonprofit page. So thanks for tuning in with us. Learn. <laughs> And happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>